Chapters ten to fourteen of First Love. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. First Love by Ivan Turgenev. Translated by Constance Garnet. Chapter ten. My real torments began from that instant. I racked my brains changed my mind and changed it back again and kept an unremitting though as far as possible secret watch on zinaida a change had come over her that was obvious she began going walks alone and long walks sometimes she would not see visitors she would sit for hours together in her room this had never been a habit of hers till now I suddenly became, or fancied I had become, extraordinarily penetrating. Isn't it he, or isn't it he? I asked myself, passing in inward agitation from one of her admirers to another. Count Malevsky secretly struck me as more to be feared than the others, though for Zinaida's sake I was ashamed to confess it to myself. My watchfulness did not see beyond the end of my nose, and its secrecy probably deceived no one. Anyway, Dr. Lushin soon saw through me. But he too had changed of late. He had grown thin, he laughed as often, but his laugh seemed more hollow, more spiteful, shorter. An involuntary nervous irritability took the place of his former light irony and assumed cynicism. "'Why are you incessantly hanging about here, young man?' he said to me one day, when we were left alone together in the Zasyekin's drawing-room. The young princess had not come home from a walk, and the shrill voice of the old princess could be heard within. She was scolding the maid. "'You ought to be studying, working, while you're young, and what are you doing?' "'You can't tell whether I work at home,' I retorted with some haughtiness but also with some hesitation. A great deal of work you do. That's not what you're thinking about. Well, I won't find fault with that. At your age that's in the natural order of things. But you've been awfully unlucky in your choice. Don't you see what this house is? I don't understand you, I observed. You don't understand. So much the worse for you. I regard it as a duty to warn you. Old bachelors like me can come here. What harm can it do us? We're tough. Nothing can hurt us. What harm can it do us? But your skin's tender yet. This air is bad for you. Believe me, you may get harm from it. How so? Why, are you well now? Are you in a normal condition? Is what you're feeling beneficial to you, good for you? "'Why, what am I feeling?' I said, while in my heart I knew the doctor was right. "'Ah, young man, young man,' the doctor went on with an intonation that suggested that something highly insulting to me was contained in these two words. "'What's the use of your prevaricating, when, thank God, what's in your heart is in your face, so far? But there, what's the use of talking? I shouldn't come here myself if the doctor compressed his lips if i weren't such a queer fellow only this is what surprises me how it is you with your intelligence don't see what is going on around you and what is going on i put in all on the alert the doctor looked at me with a sort of ironical compassion nice of me he said as though to himself, as if he need know anything of it. In fact, I tell you again, he added, raising his voice, the atmosphere here is not fit for you. You like being here, but what of that? It's nice and sweet-smelling in a greenhouse, but there's no living in it. Yes, do as I tell you, and go back to your Keidanov. The old princess came in and began complaining to the doctor of her toothache. Then Zinaida appeared. 
come said the old princess you must scold her doctor she's drinking iced water all day long is that good for her pray with her delicate chest why do you do that asked lushin why what effect could it have what effect you might get a chill and die truly do you mean it very well so much the better a fine idea muttered the doctor the old princess had gone out yes a fine idea repeated zinaida is life such a festive affair just look about you is it nice hm? or do you imagine i don't understand it and don't feel it it gives me pleasure drinking iced water and can you seriously assure me that such a life is worth too much to be risked for an instant's pleasure happiness i won't even talk about oh very well remarked lushin caprice and irresponsibility those two words sum you up your whole nature's contained in those two words zinaida laughed nervously you're late for the post my dear doctor you don't keep a good lookout you're behind the times put on your spectacles i'm in no capricious humour now to make fools of you to make a fool of myself much fun there is in that and as for irresponsibility monsieur voldemar zinaida added suddenly stamping don't make such a melancholy face i can't endure people to pity me she went quickly out of the room it's bad for you very bad for you this atmosphere young man lucian said to me once more chapter eleven on the evening of the same day the usual guests were assembled at the zasyekins i was among them the conversation turned on Meidanov's poem. Zinaida expressed genuine admiration of it. But do you know what, she said to him, if I were a poet, I would choose quite different subjects. Perhaps it's all nonsense, but strange ideas sometimes come into my head, especially when I'm not asleep in the early morning, when the sky begins to turn rosy. <laughs> at me no no we all cried with one voice i would describe she went on folding her arms across her bosom and looking away a whole company of young girls at night in a great boat on a silent river the moon is shining and they are all in white and wearing garlands of white flowers and singing you know something in the nature of a hymn i see I see, go on, Meidanov commented with dreamy significance. All of a sudden, loud clamour, laughter, torches, tambourines on the bank. It's a troop of bacchantes, dancing with songs and cries. It's your business to make a picture of it, Mr. Poet. Only I should like the torches to be red and to smoke a great deal, and the bacchantes' eyes to gleam under their wreaths and the wreaths to be dusky. Don't forget the tiger-skins, too, and goblets, and gold, lots of gold." "'Where ought the gold to be?' asked Meidanov, tossing back his sleek hair and distending his nostrils. "'Where? On their shoulders and arms and legs, everywhere. They say in ancient times women wore gold rings on their ankles. The Bacantes call the girls in the boat to them. The girls have ceased singing their hymn. They cannot go on with it, but they do not stir. The river carries them to the bank. Suddenly, one can see the This is described in my book. I shall slowly the and how her companions are afraid. She steps over the edge of the boat. The Bacantes surround her whirl her away into night and darkness here put in smoke in clouds and everything in confusion there is nothing but the sound of their shrill cry and her wreath left lying on the bank zinaida ceased 
Oh, she is in love, I thought again. And is that all? asked Meidan. That's all? That can't be the subject of a whole poem, she observed pompously. But I will make use of your idea for a lyrical fragment. In the romantic style? queried Malevsky. Of course, in the romantic style. Byronic. Well, to my mind, Hugo beats Byron, the young Count observed negligently. He's more interesting. Hugo is a writer of the first class, replied Meidanov. And my friend, Tonkosheev, in his Spanish romance, El Trovador, Ah, is that the book with the question marks turned upside down? Zinaida interrupted. Yes, that's the custom with the Spanish. I was about to observe that Tonkosheev... Come, you're not going to argue about classicism and romanticism again, Zinaida interrupted him a second time. We'd much better play... Forfeits? put in Lucian. No, forfeits are a bore at comparisons. This game Zinaida had invented herself. Some object was mentioned, everyone tried to compare it with something, and the one who chose the best comparison got a prize. She went up to the window. The sun was just setting. High up in the sky were large red clouds. "'What are those clouds like?' questioned Zinaida and without waiting for our answer, she said, I think they are like the purple sails on the golden ship of Cleopatra, when she sailed to meet Antony. Do you remember, Meidanov, you were telling me about it not long ago? All of us, like Polonius in Hamlet, opined that the clouds recalled nothing so much as those sails, and that not one of us could discover a better comparison. And how old was Antony then? inquired Zinaida. A young man, no doubt, observed Malevsky. Yes, a young man, Meidanov chimed in in confirmation. Excuse me, cried Lushin, he was over forty. Over forty, repeated Zinaida, giving him a rapid glance. I soon went home. She is in love my lips unconsciously repeated. But with whom? CHAPTER Twelve. The days passed by. Zinaida became stranger and stranger, and more and more incomprehensible. One day I went over to her, and saw her sitting in a basket chair, her head pressed to the sharp edge of the table. She drew herself up. Her whole face was wet with tears. "'Ah, you,' she said with a cruel smile, "'come here.' I went up to her. She put her hand on my head, and suddenly, catching hold of my hair, began pulling it. "'It hurts me,' I said at last. "'Ah, does it? And do you suppose nothing hurts me?' she replied. "'Ay!' she cried suddenly, seeing she had pulled a little tuft of hair out. "'What have I done? Poor Monsieur Voldemar!' She carefully smoothed the hair she had torn out, stroked it round her finger, and twisted it into a ring. "'I shall put your hair in a locket and wear it round my neck,' she said, while the tears still glittered in her eyes. "'That will be some small consolation to you, perhaps.' And now, good-bye. I went home, and found an unpleasant state of things there. My mother was having a scene with my father. She was reproaching him with something, while he, as his habit was, maintained a polite and chilly silence, and soon left her. I could not hear what my mother was talking of, and indeed I had no thought to spare for the subject. I only remember that when the interview was over, she sent for me to her room, and referred with great displeasure to the frequent visits I paid the princess, who was, in her words, une femme capable de tout. I kissed her hand, this was what I always did when I wanted to cut short a conversation, and went off to my room. Zinaida's tears had completely overwhelmed me. 
i positively did not know what to think and was ready to cry myself i was a child after all in spite of my sixteen years i had now given up thinking about malevsky though bielovzorov looked more and more threatening every day and glared at the wily count like a wolf at a sheep but i thought of nothing and of no one i was lost in imaginings and was always seeking seclusion and solitude i was particularly fond of the ruined greenhouse i would climb up on the high wall and perch myself and sit there such an unhappy lonely and melancholy youth that i felt sorry for myself and how consolatory were those mournful sensations how i revelled in them one day i was sitting on the wall looking into the distance and listening to the ringing of the bells suddenly something floated up to me not a breath of wind and not a shiver but as it were a whiff of fragrance as it were a sense of someone's being near i looked down below on the path in a light greyish gown with a pink parasol on her shoulder was zinaida hurrying along she caught sight of me stopped and pushing back the brim of her straw hat she raised her velvety eyes to me what are you doing up there at such a height she asked me with a rather queer smile come she went on you always declare you love me jump down into the road to me if you really do love me zinaida had hardly uttered those words when i flew down just as though someone had given me a violent push from behind the wall was about fourteen feet high i reached the ground on my feet but the shock was so great that i could not keep my footing i fell down and for an instant fainted away when i came to myself again without opening my eyes i felt zinaida beside me my dear boy she was saying bending over me and there was a note of alarmed tenderness in her voice how could you do it dear how could you obey you know i love you get up her bosom was heaving close to me her hands were caressing my head and suddenly what were my emotions at that moment her soft fresh lips began covering my face with kisses they touched my lips but then zinaida probably guessed by the expression of my face that i had regained consciousness though i still kept my eyes closed and rising rapidly to her feet she said come get up naughty boy silly why are you lying in the dust i got up give me my parasol said zinaida i threw it down somewhere and don't stare at me like that what ridiculous nonsense you're not hurt are you stung by the nettles i dare say don't stare at me i tell you but he doesn't understand he doesn't answer she added as though to herself go home monsieur Voldemar. brush yourself and don't dare to follow me or i shall be angry and never again she did not finish her sentence but walked rapidly away while i sat down by the side of the road my legs would not support me the nettles had stung my hands my back ached and my head was giddy but the feeling of rapture i experienced then has never come a second time in my life it turned to a sweet ache in all my limbs and found expression at last in joyful hops and skips and shouts yes i was still a child chapter 13 i was so proud and light-hearted all that day i so vividly retained on my face the feeling of zinaida's kisses with such a shudder of delight i recalled every word she had uttered i so hugged my unexpected happiness that i felt positively afraid positively unwilling to see her who had given rise to these new sensations it seemed to me that now i could ask nothing more of fate that now i ought to go and draw a deep last sigh and die 
but next day, when I went into the lodge, I felt great embarrassment, which I tried to conceal under a show of modest confidence, befitting a man who wishes to make it apparent that he knows how to keep a secret. Zinaida received me very simply, without any emotion. She simply shook her finger at me and asked me whether I wasn't black and blue. All my modest confidence and air of mystery vanished instantaneously, and with them my embarrassment. Of course I had not expected anything particular, but Zinaida's composure was like a bucket of cold water thrown over me. I realised that in her eyes I was a child, and was extremely miserable. Zinaida walked up and down the room, giving me a quick smile whenever she caught my eye. But her thoughts were far away, I saw that clearly. Shall I begin about what happened yesterday myself? I pondered. Ask her where she was hurrying off so fast, so as to find out once for all. But with a gesture of despair, I merely went and sat down in a corner. Bielozvorov came in. I felt relieved to see him. I've not been able to find you a quiet horse, he said in a sulky voice. Freitag warrants one, but I don't feel any confidence in it, I'm afraid. What are you afraid of? said Zinaida. Allow me to inquire? What am I afraid of? Why, you don't know how to ride. Lord save us, what might happen? What whim is this has come over you all of a sudden? Come, that's my business, so wild beast. In that case, I will ask Pyotr Vasilyevich. My father's name was Pyotr Vasilyevich. I was surprised at her mentioning his name so lightly and freely, as though she were confident of his readiness to do her a service. Oh, indeed, retorted Bielozvorov. You mean to go out riding with him, then? With him or with someone else has nothing to do with you. Only not with you, anyway. Not with me, repeated Bielozvorov. As you wish. Well, I shall find you a horse. Yes, only mind now, don't send some old cow. I warn you, I want to gallop. Gallop away by all means. With whom is it? With Maleski? day, bright and not too hot. A fresh, sportive breeze roved over the earth, with temperate rustle and frolic, setting all things aflutter and harassing nothing. I wandered a long while over hills and through woods. I had not felt happy, I had 
left home with the intention of giving myself up to melancholy. But youth, the exquisite weather, the fresh air, the pleasure of rapid motion, the sweetness of repose lying on the grass in a solitary nook, gained the upper hand. The memory of those never-to-be-forgotten words, those kisses, forced itself once more upon my soul. It was sweet to me to think that Zinaida could not anyway fail to do justice to my courage, my heroism. Others may seem better to her than I, I mused. Let them, but others only say what they would do while I have done it. And what more would I not do for her? could get no further with it. Meanwhile it was getting on towards dinner time. I went down into the valley, a narrow sandy path winding through it led to the town. I walked along this path. The dull thud of horses' hoofs resounded behind me. I looked round instinctively, stood still and took off my cap. I saw my father and Zinaida. They were riding side by side. My father was saying something to her, bending right over to her, his hand propped on the horse's neck. He was smiling. Zinaida listened to him in silence, her eyes severely cast down, and her lips tightly pressed together. At first I saw them only, but a few instants later Bielovzvorov came into sight round a bend in the glade. He was wearing a hussar's uniform with a police, and riding a foaming black horse. The gallant horse tossed its head, snorted and pranced from side to side. His rider was at once holding him in and spurring him on. I stood aside. My father gathered up the reins, moved away from Zinaida. She slowly raised her eyes to him, and both galloped on. Bielosvora flew after them, his sabre clattering behind him. He's as red as a crab, I reflected, while she, why is she so pale, out riding the whole morning and pale? I redoubled my pace and got home just at dinner time. My father was already sitting by my mother's chair, dressed for dinner, washed and fresh. He was reading an article from the Journal des Débats in his smooth, musical voice. But my mother heard him without attention, and when she saw me, asked where I had been to all day long, and added that she didn't like this gadding about God knows where, and God knows in what company. But I have been walking alone, I was on the point of replying, but I looked at my father and for some reason or other held my peace. End of chapter 14 Recording by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey